is everybody doing today? Today is November the 17th, 2020, in the year of COVID. Um, I hope everybody's doing okay and wearing their mask and trying to do the best that they can with all the negativity that's going on. There is a lot of negativity and a lot of strange things going on in our country, but eventually we will prevail. Uh, this uh, a mini lecture is for History 2327, uh, and that's Mexican American History. Okay, and this is going to be the introductory lecture for Unit 4 Dispossession and Social Banditry, 1850 to 1880. Now, by this time in the lecture, we are completely in the United States now. In the last one, we were kind of in and out of the United States. But now, um, after the U.S.-Mexican War, the Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and Southern California, or California proper, are part of the United States of America, okay, with the exception with the exception of the Gadsden Purchase, the Treaty of Messia, which the United States is going to buy from Santa Ana in 1855. And that's a little piece in the bottom of Arizona that's going to facilitate the building of a railroad that is going to go from Texas or from Santa Fe to uh, actually uh, Los Angeles, uh, El Paso better you know, with better words, from, from El Paso to Los Angeles. And really, that railroad is going to go from Brownsville to Laredo to Eagle Pass to El Paso to uh, southern New Mexico. And as you can see, a lot of the major cities in Arizona are in the southernmost part, go through southern Arizona and then on to Los Angeles, okay? And if they were didn't have that piece of territory, then they would have to build it through a very mountainous terrain. It's not a very good place to build a railroad. It's it's easier to buy it from Mexico. Now, the one thing that I'm going to talk about first is that what we need to see is what's going to happen to all these people that at one stroke of the pen with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, they're going to become, quote, Americans overnight. Uh, they're going to become Americans overnight, but they're also going to become scapegoats. They're also going to become victims. They're also be, uh, going to become uh, uh, peasants. They're also going to become peons. They're also going to become uh, proletariat. They're going to go from being, most of them being ranch-owning, independent individuals to being individuals that are now landless and the way that the land is going to be taken away from them is very simple okay when you buy something of any value you usually get a title or a certificate of purchase or a birth certificate right you know if you buy a bull uh, you have a certificate of birth and a certificate that it belongs to you especially if it's a an expensive one uh, when you go to PetSmart and adopt a dog, you get documentation that the dog is yours. When you buy a car, if you pay for it outright, you have a title of the car that entitles you that that car is yours. If you're borrowing money, then the bank keeps the title until you pay for it, right? When you buy a property also, you get a title to it. You have a deed, okay? Better yet, not a title, but a deed. Well. A lot of these deeds were either in Mexico, in Monterrey, Saltillo, Mexico, or in Spain. And what would happen is, is that the American authorities would come in and say, if you cannot produce a title, a deed of ownership over this land, you're, you're going to lose it, or you're going to lose a better part of it. Okay, so that's how this possession begins. They are dispossessed of their land. Now, the biggest dispossession that occurs occurs in California and in New Mexico, okay? In Texas, you'll see more of an abandonment under duress of these properties, but the bigger Spanish 
slash Mexican landowners were going to be able to hang on to their land. You will have Richard Mifflin and you will have uh, uh, Richard King and you'll have other ranchers that you'll see in your reading that we're going to discuss later on that they will buy land from Mexicans, but they'll buy it under duress. Okay, you need to find out if you don't know what the word duress means, you need to look it up. Okay, when they make you do something under duress, it's not good. A lot of times people will say, well, I'm doing this under duress and I want that noted for the fact or I am, you know, I'm not doing this because I want to. I'm doing this because I'm being pressured to do it or under retaliation or so on and so forth. Okay. Now, what this, what's going to happen is that you're, we're going to have a transition where the landed elite, landed elite, the big property owners are going to go from being wealthy landowners to being just common people. Okay. They're going to become proletariat or they're going to become just, you know, individuals who uh, no longer have land holdings. And what you're going to see here is that you're going to see methods of retaliation. You're going to see methods of, of, of how they're going to fight back. Now, there's going to be peaceful methods and then there's going to be violent methods to retaliate against Anglo encroachment. And then there's also going to be communal retaliation where a community retaliates, but they don't do it violently and they don't do it peacefully. They do it economically, okay? Now, when we look at the concept, and there's a little article that I posted that you must read, and I'm going to give you a quiz over it, it's a, it, at the centerpiece of at the centerpiece of chapter f unit four. I'm sorry, will be the phenomenon coined by Eric Hobsbawm, the theory of social banditry, and how Mexicans used it to fight against the injustices committed against them by the encroaching Anglo-Americans. Okay, and Hobsbawm says. The point about a social bandit is that there are outlaw peasants, peasant outlaws, whom the Lord and state regards as criminals. So social banditry existed before this. It existed in Europe. It existed in Mexico. It existed prior to this. But these people are seen as heroes or champions or avengers of justice, fighters for justice. You know, they may even look to them as liberators. In any case, they're admired, they help them, and they support them. The, the, the populace will admire them, help them, and support them, okay? Now, the relationship between the peasant and the rebel outlaw and the robber, it's what makes social banditry so incredibly in, uh, interesting. Okay, and it's because it is a universal phenomena that a lot of people say, well, the only reason that they were nice to the bandit is because if they weren't, then these bandits were going to, you know, do the same thing to the people that didn't like them. But, you know, history is littered with social bandits. You have, I mean, we can go as far as saying, you know, is El Chapo a social bandit? Is uh, Pablo Escobar a social bandit? Robin Hood is a social bandit. Pancho Villa is a social bandit. I mean, Pancho Villa becomes a social bandit because two Spaniards rape his sister and nobody will do anything about it. So he takes the law into his own hands and he kills these two men in order to preserve his sister's honor and then from then on he just starts robbing the wealthy Spaniards but what I mean at the end of the day let's face it Pancho Villa was a killer he was a murderer he, during the during the Mexican Revolution he had a lot of innocent people killed and and murdered 
you know, by firing squad or by his own pistol or by the pistol of Rudolfo Fierros, whatever you want to 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 say it. So I want you to read this article by Hobsbawm, and I think I misspelled it. Yes, I put a U instead of a W in the readings, and it's Hobsbawm social banditry uh, document, and it's really short. I mean, it's just going to give you... Uh, now, there's going to be different social bandits during this time. Joaquin Murieta, Las Gorras Blancas, Pancho Villa. Uh, we already had one, Cheno Cortina, as, as you all saw in the previous unit. Nepomuceno Cortina, Cheno Cortina, you know, the, the bearded bandit of, of, of South Texas. But the only thing that we know that is achieved through social banditry is death. Because, I mean, it becomes a tit for tat. A bandit, you know, like... Pancho Villa goes into Columbus, New Mexico, and he raids Columbus, New Mexico, and then Pershing's troops go into... Mexico and kill some innocent people. This is going to, this type of tit for tat, this type of, you know, tit for tat retaliation is going to be with us well into the 1930s, where the lynching of Mexicans is not going to be an uncommon thing. I would say it would be cavalier for me to say thousands of Mexicans were lynched, but I would say that high in the hundreds were lynched. We, we don't know exactly how many Mexicans were lynched because a lot of them were never found. It wouldn't surprise me if it was in the in the low thousands, like one or two thousand. But, you know, I know it's in the couple of hundreds. Uh, unlike if more African Americans were lynched than anybody else. But so I want you to get this article and that before you go any further, I want you to have a complete understanding of social banditry and the mechanisms to retaliate. And then we're going to talk about peaceful methods, which would be just peaceful not to retaliate, which means to turn the other cheek. The other one is violence. And the other one is economic. The other one is where instead of looking for Anglos for economic betterment, you're going to see the formation of mutual aid societies, okay? And this is another one that I want you to know really good. Mutual aid societies, sociedades mutualistas, okay? Now, the best example of a mutual aid society is is a tanda okay y'all know what a tanda is right if you don't know what a tanda is ask your parents and they will tell you what a tanda is but mexicans are very very successful because they're able to form mutual aid societies in their neighborhoods one a good example of of a mutual aid society was Ay, mijito, se murió Doña Cuca. Uh, pobrecita, Doña Cuca died. And she didn't want to be buried in the United States. So we're going to have a barbecue plate sale in the neighborhood. Vamos a tener un bingo. We're going to have a bingo. And the proceeds are going to be to give to her family so they can take her body back to Mexico. Right? So you go to the bingo and you donate a cake. A lot of these things are done where, you know, like a Jamaica, they a cake or you know me I have goats and I would say you know what uh, for one of the five top grand prizes I'm gonna donate a cabrito uh, and I also got a bunch of eggs so I'm gonna donate five dozens of eggs and so one of the prizes would be the cabrito right uh, another prize would be tres docenas de huevo you know what I mean and Another neighbor could make a cake, and another make, the neighbor would make five dozen of tamales, you know. Uh, and you would donate those things like you would in a Jamaica, like a cakewalk. And, you know, you play, and it's 100% profit. Juegan lotería. It's bingo. You would play lotería, and that money you would, you would, lo juntas, you would gather it, 
and that money would be used to send Doña Cuca back to Mexico because she could get buried in Mexico. Now, what do you have invested in this? Well, when your grandmother passes away, they would do the same thing. Or a tragedy would befall on you. Let's say, for example, God forbid that your grandmother had a stroke and she needed a wheelchair and there just wasn't any money. So you turn to the community and they would say, vamos a tener un bingo de lotería para, you know, so we can raise money for, you know, Doña Rosa and her wheelchair, you know, or for her gasoline for her cancer treatment transportation whatever that may be so mexicans become really really good at this a perfect example of this is again quinceañeras and weddings when you when you help somebody else with a wedding or a quinceañera or a baptism or a burial you are investing in yourself because when when your turn comes if you don't have the resources then those people are going to help you. I would guarantee you that 80% of those people are going to help you. Now, if you have the resources, you don't ask anybody for anything because you just don't do that thing. You say, I really appreciate you all trying to help, but I don't need financial help. But then that those individuals, will you will have an outpouring of sympathy instead of the financial deal. So you'll feel like, wow, you know, when my father died, I would have people that I didn't even know come up to me and tell me, you know, when I became a policeman, I didn't have any money and I came to your dad and your dad sold me a, my first pistol on credit and oh my God, Mando, it took me a year and a half to pay him, but he never put any pressure on me. So, you know, when I was done and I bought another one and he always helped me and that's how you do these things that... It, it's not like you're buying loyalty. It's that you're investing in your own people to help you. You know, when my father died, fortunately, you know, we didn't need the community to help, right? So that in itself was good. So the outpouring came with sympathy. And that was, that was cool because at that time you realized that your loved one touched a lot of people's lives. So, you know, when your parents say, I have to go to this funeral, and you say, oh my God, why? And so when they tell you that they have to go, they have to go, you know? And the, I, I didn't mean to go off on this tangent, but all these things come out of necessity. And that's why Mexicans become so you know, economically successful. And that's another reason why we, we keep to ourselves and we don't get involved in things that que no nos merecen a nosotros because we know how to depend on our own people instead of depending on others. If you if you don't believe that this is true, look at banking institutions. There's a lot of banking institutions that cater to Spanish speaking people. The number one banking institution that caters to Spanish-speaking people is Bank of America, okay? They have spent millions, millions of dollars in advertising targeting Mexican-Americans and Spanish-speaking people. There is a Bank of America across the street from the town Plaza, from the, you know where I'm talking about on seminary, that bank, I think, has one, two, three, four, five or six ATM machines, okay? And it is supposed to be one of the highest traffic Bank of Americas in DFW. It's predominantly Hispanic, okay? So the deal is, is that we pool our resources. And this is out of necessity because at, at this time, in the times where they were taking land away from us, we could only turn to ourselves to help each other out, right? And this is very, very common of the border, the, the border of the Southwest, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and California. Now, land dispossession in California is going to be big. Land dispossession in New Mexico is going to be really big but those were really not ranches they were more like ejidos or ranchos tierra big chunks of land that were given to people to work communal 
and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. I'm sorry for that. My daughter decided she was going to come out here and start yelling at the top of her lungs at the dog and with no regard to what I'm doing. Um, I forgot where I was, but um, hold on. Let me pause this for a minute. We were talking about land dispossession. And I, I don't have any notes when I do it. I just do it off the top of my head. So New Mexico, you're going to see that. And later on in the next unit, I'm going to explain somebody that's going to go after those claims. In Arizona, there's not a lot of people living in Arizona. Okay, Arizona really doesn't, population-wise, doesn't really take off until uh, the 1940s, 1950s. And in Southern California, most of the Mexicans that own land there are just reduced to peasants and migrant workers okay that's what a lot of these mexicans that have not a lot of land but a little bit of land are going to become migrant workers that they're going to migrate we're going to talk about that later on and as i said in texas it was varied it varied through regions what happened in texas a lot is that a lot of the spanish-speaking landowners just sold their land so they wouldn't so they didn't deal with it and they kept a little bit and they sold some of it to get that pressure off their back. But that doesn't mean that atrocities didn't happen. Okay, so I want you to read about social banditry. And I want you to know what social banditry is before we move on. And I will post another mini lecture. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the readings, the paper readings. You are required to read that, okay? Read it. I know what I'm telling you. If you don't, you're not going to do well. This is the last unit. We don't have a lot of time left, but you know it's uh it's hammer time as mc hammer would say okay you all take care and be kind to each other and uh be looking out for another video